but let's get to why we're all here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm incredibly pleased to introduce uh, Dr. James Knapp from the Boone Pickens School of Geology at Oklahoma State University. Go Pokes! Um, I've had the, the great pleasure of, of interacting with both he and his wife Camilla uh, as they've come into the department. Um, he is he actually holds the Boone Pickens Distinguished Chair of Geosciences. And he specializes in the areas of structural geology, tectonics, geophysics, and petroleum geology. He has a bachelor's degree with distinction from Stanford and a PhD in structural geology and tectonics from MIT. Uh, he joined the faculty at OSU in, in 2018, but of course that was after 20 years being at the University of South Carolina where he now holds a distinguished professor emeritus. Before he was at the University of South Carolina, as an associate professor in 98, though, he spent several years working in the petroleum industry for Shell. I have forgiven him for that, uh, both as a research and an exploration geologist and as a member of the research faculty at Cornell. During his career, he and his research team have done fundamental and applied research and design acquisition, processing, and interpretation of surveys, both onshore and offshore, which is why it's so cool. He's here to talk about how that all began. Uh, he served as a congressional witness He's made numerous public appearances concerning offshore seismic acquisition and energy development as well. During his tenure at South Carolina, he served in various administrative and faculty leadership functions, including the chair of the um, Columbia Faculty Senate. He's married to another geoscientist, so we have that in common as well. My husband's also a geoscientist. Uh, he's married to Dr. Camilla Knapp, who's the head of the Boone Pickens School of Geology at OSU. And, and they have two wonderful daughters, which keep them very active as well. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Knapp, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to let him start sharing his. Did that work? That worked. You are good to go. All right. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh... Thank you ever so much, Patty, for that uh, very gracious introduction. And, and thank you to uh, all of the attendees here this evening showing up, uh, especially in competition with the uh, national <laughs> college championship football game. So uh, I'm going to endeavor to uh, keep this, I got to get that out of the way, I guess. Um, I, I've tried to limit this to about a half an hour so that we can have a little time for uh, questions afterwards. And um, it's great to be reunited uh, with the uh, Houston Geological Society. I, I first joined the uh, organization uh, in 1988 when I was working with Shell. Unfortunately, I haven't kept my membership active, but it's, uh, it's great to be back. So um, I'm going to share with you my... Uh, uh, essentially a newfound interest, and I won't claim at the outset to be the, the world authority on this, but um, when we moved to Oklahoma several years ago, I was, uh, I was very surprised to start learning about the, the origins of the discipline that I've pursued for most of my professional life. So the title is Reflection Seismology, Born in Oklahoma. And uh, here's just a, a brief outline, uh, Confessions of a Lifelong Seismologist, I want to put in a little plug for the upcoming Seismic Reflection Centennial. That's a, uh, an event coming up in May of this year, uh, sponsored by the uh, Society of Exploration Geophysicists. And then go into the background that led to the, uh, the, the uh, geophysical technique that really transformed not just uh, the, the whole world of extractive industries of the subsurface, but as I would argue, really led to so many fundamental advances in our knowledge of the earth as a result of being able to uh, image the subsurface. And that was really led by a gentleman by the name of John Clarence Karcher and his colleagues. And I'll try and uh, outline that background and then move on to some of what I feel are the uh, seminal scientific contributions that have come from reflection seismology. And, and in particular for me, the uh, the area of deep seismic reflection seismology where we're imaging the upper hundreds of kilometers of the earth. So I don't, I don't want to belabor this because uh, it was already in my uh, gracious introduction there, but I will point out that, um, yes, I was at, at Shell Oil and that's really uh, went for, through a transformation from being 
uh, a geologist, a structural field geologist, to a geophysicist. And um, it was on that basis that I, uh, I landed a research position at Cornell University, uh, which was the, the home of the uh, deep seismic reflection program, basically, in the United States for the, lat for the latter half of the, the 20th century. And those tie into this, uh, this history of, of the development of uh, reflection seismology in an interesting way. So, um, uh, and then led most recently to my role here at the Boone Pickens Distinguished Chair of Geoscience. So when we moved here, uh, I, I was casually out uh, helping out on an introductory uh, geology field trip down to the Arbuckles where I came across this monument. <laughs> along I-35 and uh, was shocked to learn that the, the discipline that I had been engaging in for, for decades was actually reportedly uh, developed here in Oklahoma by Oklahomans. And I was just uh, somewhat shocked to, to uh, come to that realization. And the more I've talked with people over the years, uh, the more it seems like there's a lot of other people that may not have been aware of the, the role that that Oklahomans here in Oklahoma played in, in uh, the development of such a fundamental technique. And um, th that led me uh, back in basically uh, 2019 to start mobilizing, uh, realizing we were coming up on the, the centennial for the invention of this technology uh, to start reaching out to other colleagues to say, look, we really ought to celebrate this. This is such a a fundamental transformation of, uh, of our understanding of the earth that's come from seismic reflection techniques. So we've, <laughs> like everyone else, we've been riding the, the pandemic roller coaster, but we finally have focused on May of this coming, of this year, it's May 17th through 19th to, uh, to hold the seismic reflection centennial uh, sponsored by SEG um, and it'll be a three-day event, May 17th to 19th, um, uh, organized by uh, University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University, and University of Tulsa. Um, we're, we've also got uh, involvement of the Geophysical Society of Oklahoma City, Geophysical Society of uh, Tulsa, and really hoping to engage uh, quite a broad array of, uh, of students to come and uh, participate not only in learning the, the history, but what the, the future of reflection seismology is. Uh, the, the, uh, this is just a plug for that. That's It's up on the SEG website. Uh, there'll be uh, a three-day event, uh, but uh, based out of Stillwater, we'll spend the first day down in Norman at the OU campus. Second day here with, uh, again, technical talks and an outreach event. And then day three is actually going to be a uh, field trip to the historic sites where these uh, experiments were actually made. And I think that's going to be um, a really exciting thing to do and, and uh, share in the history of this uh, important event. Um, I'm going to, um, or maybe um, Patty can, while we're talking, uh, put the uh, the URL here for that the SEG webpage and you can find out more information there. So let's turn to the um, subject at hand, and that relates to John Carter and his and his team. And uh, I, I think it's it's telling to, to look back at what the historical draft backdrop was to, to 1921. We're talking 100 years ago, and if we think about what was uh, recently going on in Oklahoma, Oklahoma achieved statehood in 1907, and that was in part driven by the fact that there were uh, so many major oil discoveries that were made starting in, in around 1900 through the, the first 20 years here in Oklahoma. And uh, it became clear early on that there was a, a tremendous wealth in the subsurface here. Um, World War I ended around, well, on Armistice Day, so 1918, November 11th, but it was in the latter year of the of World War I that <laughs> there was a global flu pandemic, and that sounds familiar at this stage, that lasted uh, for the better part of, of more than a couple of years. I think we're already uh, beyond that with ours, but um, it's just a, an eerie parallel that here we are 100 years later going through a lot of the same issues. 
prohibition went into effect on the 17th of January, 1920. We had a uh, new president sworn in in 1921, which uh, we did uh, this year as well. Uh, Warren G. Harding was sworn in as, as president at the time. And then of, of very specific relevance to uh, the state of Oklahoma, um, the uh, dates of late May to June of 1921 marked the, uh, the Tulsa race riot. So it's, it's interesting to contemplate how Karcher and his team, literally days after the race riot in Tulsa, we're out developing this new geophysical technique in Oklahoma City and then down in the Arbuckle Mountains. So uh, Karcher was was born actually in uh, in southern Indiana in the late 1890s, born April 15th. And when uh, he was only five years old, the family moved to Hennessy, Oklahoma, which is not too far west of us here in Stillwater. But he was uh, clearly a very bright young man and uh, quickly moved on to, uh, to studying physics at OU, graduated with a BS in physics, and then uh, moved on to a PhD at uh, University of Pennsylvania to, to study physics. But it was during this, this period while he was engaged in his PhD work that he started working at the US Bureau of Standards during World War I. And one of the issues they were trying to uh, resolve at that time, both here on the on the Allies side and on the Axis side was looking at atmospheric acoustics to try and understand the ranging of artillery during the, the war effort. And so it was a very high priority uh, endeavor on both sides of the war to try and understand how sound propagates through air and how that could be used strategically in the, the outcome of the war. But uh, Karcher was, was already at that time thinking about ways in which the same concept might be used to look at uh, the subsurface of the earth. And so it's, it's interesting, yet another example of how um, war-related war research ultimately plays into uh, lots of other uh, advancements for society. So the first uh, seismic reflection crews uh, were were really um, the list here. So Karcher was really the, the lead and, and the driving force of this, but he was helped out by several others, including William Hazeman, who was the head of the Department of Physics at the University of Oklahoma. Then there was Dr. O'Hearn, who was a former geology professor and at the time um, the director of the Oklahoma Geological Survey. Then there was Irving Perrine, uh, former head of the Department of Geology at the University of Oklahoma and a graduate of Co Cornell University. And then finally, one of uh, Perrine's former students, William Kite. And this, this really formed the, the group of uh, individuals who actually went out and did the work and um, proved the, the technology back in 1921. And I just think it's an interesting, or it's telling that it really took uh, physicists getting together with geologists to, to figure out geophysics. And I think that's, uh, that, that tells us a lot about the, the value in bringing different disciplines together to uh, create new ones. Uh, just one sidelight here about uh, Dr. Perrine. So I mentioned uh, that he had Cornell connections. In fact, he was originally born in New York State and then did uh, his bachelor's, master's, and PhD study at Cornell University. I never knew that when during the time that I was there, but um, I just I thought it was an interesting connection because then he came to uh, to Oklahoma. Um, and ended up being a real driving force in the, in the industry, was one of the founding members of the AAPG and was, was really a, a leader in the, uh, in the whole uh, petroleum industry for his time here in Oklahoma. Well, this is a, a, a timeline for uh, discovery, as I call it. Um, the uh, so, so spring of 1921, Karcher was involved with the development of uh, seismometers while he was doing his work at the, at the Bureau of Standards. And in May of that year, he uh, applied for and received a six-month leave 
uh, such that he could come and, and try and, and ground test his, his, seismo his uh, seismic equipment. And so they, they carried out the, the first experiment in early June of that year. Again, this was literally a few days after the Tulsa race riots. And uh, the Belle Isle experiment was successful in the sense that uh, they were able to image what they believed to be reflections off of geologic boundaries in the subsurface. But um, they were convinced by the geologists uh, that were part of the group that, that what they really needed to do was, was conduct a test where they could actually ground truth it from the surface geology. And so that's where the geologists convinced the team to move down to the Arbuckle Mountains here in Oklahoma and carry out the, the additional experiments in July and early August of 1921 uh, to actually show the viability of the technique. So we really are just a, a little over 100 years beyond the uh, development of this amazing technology. So the, the Bell Isle experiment, um, at the time it was in a suburb of Oklahoma City. It was actually developed as a, essentially an amusement area built around a uh, power station. Um, and so there was a, a large cooling lake there, but the, the field crew went out there to uh, set off their dynamite shots and record uh, reflections. And this consisted of Karcher, Hazeman, Vereen, and Kite. Uh, and they did that work on, on June 4th of 1921, um, a little ways west of Belle Isle. Now, in this Google image down in the lower part of the screen here, this is um, a, a Google image of modern-day Oklahoma City. And you can see this little red marker here. That, that's Belle Isle, where the experiment was done. Uh, it's now <laughs> uh, no longer a suburb. It's pretty much part of, uh, of, of Oklahoma City. So what they were able to do is uh, show that they could record reflections, but uh, because of the relatively shallow dip of the stratigraphy there, they couldn't definitively say that they were imaging a geologic boundary. They had pretty good idea they were, but um, they needed to be able to tie it to some known surface geology. Uh, 50 years later, the uh, Belle Isle Monument was established uh, in 1971. And it was, it was uh, established outside the uh, Belle Isle Public Library. About the time that we got started organizing this uh, event, uh, for reasons, just amazing timing, they decided they were going to renovate the library. And so they actually went and uh, took the monument and put it in storage. So uh, we're still in the process of looking for a new location, but... Um, exploring designation of this uh, monument as a uh, National Historic Landmark. You can see here's Karcher at the time of the original dedication, 50-year dedication, and it's a, it's a very massive uh, monument, but it, it uh, is written in granite, actually, what, uh, what the significance of the event was. Well, so, as I said, they, 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 they tested the seismographs, and this is some of uh, Carter's own words. He says that, um, that he had started talking with uh, O'Hearn and Perrin and, and concluded that they really needed to go someplace where they could um, test their technique on, on geology, where they could know the geology from the surface, especially uh, contacts between formations. And so that's when they headed out to the Arbuckle Mountains, uh, where uh, these same strata had been uh, previously deformed, and we could, uh, or they could, um, examine the formations at the surface, and then compare that with their subsurface measurements. And this uh, part of the reason was there was a fairly full uh, Paleozoic section uh, exposed in the structures there, where they could uh, observe. Uh, everything from granite in the basement up through uh, sandstones, limestone, shales, uh, lithologies with different seismic uh, velocity properties. So here's a uh, modern day map of the uh, state of Oklahoma with the Arbuckle Mountains here. And I just want to uh, give a little plug here for some of the work we've been doing since, since I got to, uh, to Oklahoma. I'm a big fan of GIS. And so in the last few years, I've been putting together a, uh, a GIS uh, database. Here's one of the 
maps of the Arbuckle Mountains. Again, we go all the way from uh, crystalline basement here in these, uh, in these pink colors up through all of the purples and, uh, and browns and whatnot. Uh, nice stratigraphy that's exposed. And it was, it was right here in this uh, part of the geology of the Arbuckles where the uh, group started to focus for their original experiments. And they kept uh, very uh, detailed uh, notes, it turns out, of what they did. So Karcher's uh, notes are stored in these red books. So this one's every, the, the original field notebook from 1921, where he recorded uh, the process of going down to the Arbuckles in, in July of that year. And they first started by uh, carrying out essentially refraction surveys within different units that were exposed at the surface to, to determine what the seismic velocities were. And so they did a number of experiments uh, to, within distinct units to determine what the uh, seismic, the P wave velocities were to be sure that they were going to have a target that was going to have a very robust signature. So here are the, uh, the original records. This is uh, from a paper that Karcher published in 1987, but these are the photostat records of the uh, records that they took in, in the Arbuckle Mountains. And, you know, by modern standards, they, they look uh, fairly meager, but they were revolutionary in their time. And, and that was one of the contributions Karcher made was the design of the seismographs such that they could uh, have a zero time uh, provided through a tuning fork uh, that kept time and then they uh, had a, a, a record with time that was essentially reflections off of a mirror that uh, went onto a photographic paper. On the left side here is, is a, a sketch from Karcher and it shows uh, couple of important things. It, it's showing the ground surface, um, you know, leading up uh, in the direction that they were recording. It shows the interpreted boundary that they feel like the image between the sylvan shale overlying the Viola limestone. So a relatively low velocity shale with a high velocity limestone sitting beneath it and a dipping geologic contact that they could trace uh, from the surface downward based on the dip of the, of the structure. So this was dated August 19th, and this, is, this just shows the, um, the acquisition scheme. They basically had uh, a series of repeated shots with a receiver uh, where they uh, imaged these, uh, uh, essentially these reflections uh, in this kind of a pattern and connected those to make a uh, an image of that boundary. So this was really the, uh, the first conclusive evidence that they could show that what they were imaging with the reflections was very reasonably the contact between these different geologic units. So the Arbuckle ex experiment um, was conducted in, in a place called Vines Branch in the Arbuckle Mountains, and we can still identify that today. Uh, the crew consisted of Karcher, Hazeman, Perrine, and O'Hearn, and it provided a geologic setting with lithologies having a large difference in seismic velocity. So it was a good target for testing the technique. And in, in, in particular, the measurements could be verified by the surface geology. Well, so it turns out that despite the, uh, all of the documentation and extensive notes, there's still uncertainty as to where actually they fired off those shots. So what, what Karcher's accounts indicate is that they were following the creek bed of Vines Creek, but if you remember from his drawing, the stratigraphy is dipping in towards the, there's, there's no um, compass orientations on his map, but the, the topography is increasing and the, the structure is dipping in the opposite direction. So topography increases eastward, Geologic structure indicates the eastern limb of an anticline. Um, and so this is uh, now getting back to my uh, GIS database. I've put together what's referred to as a moderate resolution digital elevation model for Oklahoma, which is shown here. It's actually more than Oklahoma. Uh, here's Oklahoma and it's all the surrounding region. But this 
this is a digital elevation model that has a value every uh, 10 by 10 meters on the ground. So it's about a 30 gigabyte data set, but it's, uh, we're having fun extracting all kinds of things out of here. But um, one of the things you do with GIS databases is integrate it with other data. And so I've, I've, I've put the geologic map into the, the database as well. And if we zoom in to the Arbuckle Mountains down here, here's still water up here, but uh, we're gonna zoom into the Arbuckles. Here's what that structure looks like uh, on this uh, digital elevation model. So these are the, the structures, the, uh, the anticlines that were the target and, and shown in blue here is, is Vines Creek. That's uh, well established. Um, and then you, you see in the, uh, the, the background here, uh, pretty high resolution uh, topography and the stream meanders, et cetera. And then we uh, included on this um, an overlay of the geology such that um, we can now see how these geologic formations uh, are expressed in the topography. And that contact between the sylvan shale and the Viola limestone is represented by this uh, purple, uh, this purple interval here sitting on top of this uh, pink layer. And so there's really only one place uh, in this uh, particular configuration that uh, seems to act, seems to abide by all of the constraints we have. They were in the creek bed of Vines Creek. Uh, the, they're on the eastern limb of what's informally called the Dougherty Anticline. And the, so this, the stratigraphy is dipping east, but the topography is going up towards the east. So we think this is probably the most uh, reasonable place where the those first um, seismic experiments were carried out. There isn't anywhere else along Vines Creek where you would uh, where you would reasonably in, in, uh, satisfy all of those conditions. Well, let me turn then to what I believe are some of the seminal contributions that have come from from Karcher's uh, pioneering work with his colleagues. And this, this is gonna play more into the experience I've had with reflection seismology more in the scientific realm. But it wasn't, so, so uh, Karcher, even though they did their work in 1921, it wasn't until 1929 that he uh, actually submitted his patent application. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't granted until 1932. So by that time, though, um, other workers were taking his, his techniques and uh, moving into many other areas. Um, and in, in particular, it was by the early to mid 1930s that uh, Maurice Ewing at Columbia University was taking uh, seismic methods, both refraction and reflection into the marine environment. Well, some of you may recognize Maurice Ewing as uh, one of the legends of, of marine geophysics, and he was. And um, he led an effort that basically started, uh, well, they did the uh, first, uh, off, first marine experiment uh, off of, uh, uh, actually outside of Washington, D.C., outside of uh, Chesapeake Bay. Um, and then with World War II, that brought a very extensive exploration of the ocean basins, a lot of other geophysics, including gravity and magnetics that ultimately, uh, I think arguably let, it was marine geophysics was pivotal to the whole development of the plate tectonic paradigm. Well, it turns out that uh, one of the people that was studying under uh, Maurice Ewing as a graduate student, a PhD student was Jack Oliver. And when he, uh, graduated from Columbia, he was hired at Cornell. Uh, and he went there specifically to <laughs> essentially come back onshore and uh, build an effort for doing to the continents what uh, Maurice Ewing and his colleagues had done with the ocean basins. So here's a, uh, this is one of those first publications of uh, marine seismic. It was published in 1937 in the Bulletin of the Geological Society of America, but it shows uh, this Cape Henry profile uh, was 
onshore, offshore, uh, across the mouth of Chesapeake Bay here. Uh, and these are the uh, these are the interpretations. Again, integrated uh, refraction. So these are velocity picks. But you can also see on this the, the places where they were marking reflections um, on their records at each one of these uh, stations that they were observing. At. And so they were already starting to put together not only the velocity structure of oceanic crust, but also some idea of what continental margins look like. Uh, and that quickly led to the, the uh, revelation that oceanic crust was fundamentally different than continental crust, and there had to be some kind of scientific rationale for that. So they, these, this was published in 37, but the work was actually done in the early to mid-1930s. It just took them a while to, to get the uh, work in, into publication. Well, so Jack Oliver went to, uh, to, to Cornell, and that's where he started leading an effort for uh, developing, as I said, a, a program for studying the continents that was, at that point, they were less known than the ocean basins because it was a lot easier to go out and collect uh, geophysical data in the ocean. So um, he led an effort for the establishing the Consortium for Continental Reflection Profiling, established in 1972. Uh, again, this would have been basically a year after the 50-year anniversary for uh, Karcher's work. And lo and behold, the, uh, the first experiment uh, was conducted in Hardeman County, Texas in 1975, uh, just over the Red River from Oklahoma. So uh, we, Oklahoma was, in fact, it, it suspected these could have just as easily been collected in Oklahoma. But this is a, a location map, a reproduction of that first uh, deep seismic profiles that were collected in Hardeman County, Texas. This was the sort of the first effort to try and see if these reflection techniques could be applied to looking at the entire continental crust. And this is a reprocessed image, but this is uh, 15 seconds two-way travel time. Uh, and what you're seeing is a uh, an image of uh, essentially uh, layer stratigraphy in the upper crust, uh, sort of diffuse uh, discontinuous uh, reflectivity in a lower crust. And then as we, after decades of research, come to appreciate a fairly transparent or non-reflective mantle down below. And so this really led to uh, an explosion, literally, of uh, exploration of the continents uh, that was uh, instrumental in actually driving the development of large uh, research programs at the National Science Foundation, including the Continental Dynamics Program, which was specifically established to try and uh, support large geophysical campaigns like this because it was so critical to try and understand uh, the deep structure of the, of the continents. So this, uh, this, orig this initial effort uh, here in the United States really led to a proliferation of these kind of programs throughout uh, other countries in the late 20th century. So there was the CoCorp uh, effort. There was the, the British Institutions for Refle Reflection Profiling Syndicate, uh, the Daycorp program, uh, Lithoprobe in, in Canada. There were, there were a number of others. This, this is only a handful. It was primarily within uh, developed countries, but uh, where they had the resources to mount this kind of effort. But it was also in many ways linked to uh, where there was uh, support from the, the uh, industry community to, to carry out these kinds of uh, experiments. Just, just a few highlights that I think are, are a very direct result of, uh, of using this technique. Um, you know, I think we, we now have a, a much broader understanding of the crustal structure of mountain belts and sedimentary basins, how they evolve over geologic time, what the, uh, the nature of the MOHO discontinuity is, and how that's evolved over time, what that means for continental evolution. Similarly, for the uh, character and evolution of the lower crust and upper mantle, areas that traditionally are just inaccessible, but through these kind of techniques, we have a, a possibility to at least have a visual image and, and actually talk about physical properties of these parts of the of the earth and then of course uh, just a, 
a better understanding of the tectonic evolution of, of continents. So this is just an example on the on the image here from the lithoprobe program, where it's essentially a, a transcontinental cross section. Um, 6,000 kilometers long. It's not continuous, but if you stitch up together all of these, uh, where you have uh, an, an image, a, a direct image of the upper several hundred kilometers of the Earth over a 6,000 kilometer profile and can relate that to the uh, exposed surface geology. So, you know, the, again, these this is all uh, can be traced back to uh, to John Karcher and, and his colleagues in, in terms of the contributions that that's resulted in for, for the scientific community. And I just, um, since this has been my <laughs> forte for, for the last number of decades, one of the, when I went to Cornell, the, the Soviet Union had just, uh, had just ended and, and I went there specifically with an interest in developing a, uh, a research program in what was at that point uh, the, the former Soviet Republic. So we did a, this is a 500 kilometer long seismic transect across the Ural Mountains, which had never been imaged in this way, um, down to 60 seconds two-way travel time. And uh, again, 500 kilometers along, here's the topography across the Urals there, comparable to, let's say the Appalachians. Uh, but you can see all of this uh, reflectivity, which really marks the, uh, the crust. Uh, and there's then, um, we, we argued a, a preserved crustal root there that's part of the whole geodynamic preservation of the Urals. But the reason I put this in is that we were astonished, even in those days, this was published in 96, that we were seeing reflections, uh, coherent and continuous reflections as deep as 150 kilometers or perhaps in excess of 200 kilometers with conventional seismic reflection techniques. We, we did a number of tests to try and figure out if these were artifacts or out of the plane reflections, multiples, et cetera. We were never able to convince ourselves of that. So for lack of any other <laughs> interpretation, we, interp we speculated highly that that might have been the, uh, the base of the lithosphere. So, um, I'm going to end with that, and I'm hoping we have a little time for questions, but uh, I'll just conclude with, you know, that really Oklahoma has an outstanding history of contributions to earth science. Um, reflection seismology was developed here by Oklahomans in Oklahoma, and it's really revolutionized many aspects of, of the subsurface, not just scientifically, but certainly uh, in many ways for the uh, energy industry. Many scientific seminal, uh, seminal scientific discoveries can be traced back directly back to Karcher and his colleagues and encourage everyone to uh, check out our seismic reflection centennial and, and uh, get your abstract and registration. So I'm going to leave it there and be happy to uh, entertain questions. Great. Yep, Jim, if I can get you to stop sharing your screen. I will do that now. Uh, as long as I can figure out how to do it. Oh, there, you <laughs> you should, there you go. Got it. Perfect. Yes. And I had said, actually, um, I, I'm always paranoid about touching my screen when anyone's presenting. So I didn't type the link in yet. I said I, I would do that. Um, Jim Tucker had originally asked a question about the velocity on side, slide 12 or those outcrop or subsurface measurements. Um, but then he did come in and say, it looks like you answered that on slide 20. Uh, yeah, let me go back to slide 12 just to make sure that I... Uh, and while you're doing that, I will... Yeah, those... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, those, those were seismic measurements. Yeah, Jim, th those were... Basically, they, they did refraction experiments specifically constrained into those, those the Hunt and the Hill, Sylvan and the Viola limestone. So they, they knew they had direct measurements on this. Okay, perfect. I actually have a question for you. So sure. I saw the monument, which is fascinating. I had no idea there was a monument. What are they going to 
to do with it? Why wouldn't you even move it to the site where the they actual took that first seismogram? It's just in storage, you said? Well, okay, so, th you know, that's, um, that's part of the intrigue about our uh, seismic reflection centennial, because right when we got started developing this, there, there are two mon monuments. There's the Bell Isle Monument, and then there was what used to be called the I-35 Monument, which was mm -hmm. just on a, a pullout in, in, on I-35 as you go up into the Arbuckle. But I think, I don't know what the original rationale was, but uh, I'm led to believe they thought, well, it's going to be higher traffic on the interstate than if we put it off on some back road on somebody's private property. So once we got started organizing this event, you know, just coincidentally, it turned out both of the monuments were somehow being disturbed and moved. <laughs> it's just like, wait a minute, this can't be. We, we have sort of taken, our committee has sort of taken control over uh, relocating the I-35 monument, and it's going to now be, have a resting place um, on Turner Falls Lookout, which is actually closer oh. to where, yeah, it's actually closer to where those original experiments were done, and we're still trying to figure out how we can um, get the, the Belle Isle monument back, but the we're going to be visiting both of those localities during the, uh, the centennial and actually uh, going and hopefully the, the monuments are back in place. And ultimately, we'd like to get them established as National Historic Landmarks. I mean, they, they really are such a state. That would be very cool. Oh, Probably yeah. Probably only a, you know, geoscientist can appreciate. Uh, well, yeah, but I think, you know, it, there are ways in which it could be um, impressed upon the public, especially in a place like Oklahoma, which, let's face it, you can't underestimate the role that uh, the petroleum has played in the, the history of Oklahoma. It's true. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, I do have another question for you, and then I'm going to ask you to, again, reiterate, I'll, or I can put the slide back up about when the event is. So out of all this research, most of which I didn't know the history of, especially considering I am born and raised in Oklahoma, what was there anything that particularly surprised you or, you know, you were kind of like, wow, I can't believe this. And have you actually gone to the Vine River site? So uh, to start with the first one, there's a lot that has surprised me, I have to say. And one of those um, issues is that um, the, I guess the degree that th there are certain people that are aware of this history, but it's just surprising to me how many people aren't. I mean, even people that have practiced reflection seismology or geophysics their entire career, but it just seems like the, uh, you know, the people that develop the technique have never properly gotten their due. I mean, even in the textbooks, you hear about Fessenden and some of the other people that were involved in the early days of of geophysics, but it just seems like in certain ways um, the effort that went on here in Oklahoma was was overlooked. Um, I I have not been to the uh, Vines Branch site, but uh, 10 years ago, this is before we got here, uh, there was a, the 90 year celebration of the <laughs> of the uh, reflection seismology, and that was they actually there was a a very active student group at uh, OU that organized a trip to go up there and actually visit the site. So we have some, um, so we have some pretty good knowledge of who the landowner is and you know, how to get there. And so uh, we even had some thoughts. We, we've uh, developed a uh, shallow seismic reflection system here at OSU in, in the past year, and uh, thinking it's a it's a weight drop mounted on a an ATV, and I'm, I've had some thoughts of taking that up there and see oh, if recreate. We can, yeah, re recreate the uh, the profile because nobody's ever done that, and uh, it would just be you know okay, here it is. This is the Dawson Geophysical did something similar at the Bell Isle site uh, for the 90 year anniversary, but uh, nobody's ever gotten to. Uh, Nobody's ever gone and done it at the, the Vines branch. So. That would be cool. So Barbara oh, yeah. Hill has a, um, she typed in that, a, yes, and I know she's also an, an Oklahoma State grad, go Pokes. Um, yeah. 
and is asking if we can put the slide up on the upcoming event and discuss it again. I actually yeah, sure. can do that, Jim. This is the one. Let me share my screen. Share screen. Share screen, Patty. Oh, share helps if you actually do it. And okay, Jim, if you want to talk through this one more time. Right. So the, the way we've structured this, I mean, you know, I, sort of this sort of grew organically. It turned out that there was a, a group at OU that was starting to talk about this uh, three years ago. And of course, as soon as I found out of it, I thought, oh, well, we have to do something. I mean, this is so important. And we were sort of working independently and then finally realized, well, why wouldn't we be doing all this together? So that's where we came up with this uh, approach where we were going to basically um, split the time between Norman and Stillwater for technical presentations. And it's, it's, it's the way it's currently structured is sort of the, we're going to bring everyone to Stillwater such that you don't have to keep moving around, uh, but that you can, we'll, we'll have a bus that goes down to Norman to, to have a uh, series of talks there that are, are more the historical perspective. They've got a, uh, historic museum there that's got a lot of the material relating to the uh, development of reflection seismology. Belle Isle is right there in Oklahoma City. And then uh, the second day would be here at Stillwater and it's going to be focused on more, you know, where we are headed with the, uh, the seismic reflection method, what are some of the new technologies, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, etc. And then we're intending to have a um, an outreach day on that afternoon to try to invite in school groups and uh, vendors and things of that nature to, to actually uh, get to know the, the geophysical uh, approach. And then the third day, which would again leave from Stillwater, would be to go down, visit the, uh, the sites in Arbuckles, not focused on the where the seismic was done, but also to uh, visit some of the other key geologic steps and that's going to be led by uh, Molly Turco. Yeah, that's cool. Molly Molly was our speaker in October and and does a lot of continuing education with AAPG as well. So that she's published some really cool papers on the geology of Oklahoma. Right. Yeah, no when when I mean we were we were trying to figure out who was going to be able to lead this. I I'm I'm a structural geologist, and I, I can certainly go out and lead students in the field, but I don't know the geology of Oklahoma like people that have been here for, for many years. So uh, I, I'm helping out, but we've got, I think, a really good team of uh, people that are putting together the, the field trip. And then the premise is that we're going, we're talking with uh, the journal Frontiers and Earth Science right now to have a special volume that would come out of this meeting, and that uh, that would hopefully capture a lot of the um, the information that's presented at the meeting for posterity to have as a reference for the, the development of reflection seismology. That would be cool. So quickly, we have we have two more questions. Um, one, your thoughts on this is from Jim Decina. Apologies if I'm pronouncing names wrong. Kind of bad about that. Um, he asked, "What crystal seismic reflection work do you, is planned for the next hundred years?" <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, the, the, the deal is a lot of those uh, programs ran their course, you know, it was like, I mean, when I was there at Cornell, you know, you had to come up with every time you wanted to do one of those uh, big experiments, you had to have a world-class problem. It had to be world-class in some place where that was the only place you could do it and you needed to go spend, you know, millions of dollars. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of those that go on anymore. There's still some some work, but you know, I would say some of the the, the uh, brightest future is is conducting these kind of experiments on other planetary bodies <laughs> in the next hundred years. I mean, if you start if you see the kind of things that are going on with space exploration right now, it's it's nothing short of astounding, and uh, you know the the prospect of, of collecting subsurface data in places like uh, Mars or, or even on the moon for that matter and, and understanding structure of these other bodies and how that relates to their uh, evolution. I think that would be uh, 
that would be pretty far out there. I mean, we've already got a, a seismometer on Mars, right? It's yeah, yeah, that's recording cool. Recording Mars quakes. <laughs> and one last well, yeah. question. Sorry. And well, one last question that. by Steve Knapp. He said, I was told by my house colleagues that Amarada played a pivotal role in this story with de Gaulle and McDermott. Um, started GSI with Karcher after GRC was spun off. Is that true? Yes, yes. And in fact, that's a whole part of this that I, I didn't get into. But I mean, de Gaulle, he's another major player in this whole thing. And, and there were people that recognized early on what the, the financial potential was for this technique. I mean, Karcher, I think Karcher had a pretty clear sense of that as well, even though he was trained as a scientist and a physicist. But but I think you know he understood what the what the economic impact potentially was, and it was literally within months that they took this technique. Um, they they went and shopped it to certain investors that didn't want to buy into it, but um, within months they had actually used it to uh, identify a subsurface structure, drill it, and find and make a discovery. Um, l literally within months of developing the technique, so. It's, you know, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot more to the history than, than I was able to cover in this talk, but there's, there's actually a, a fairly lengthy literature on how the, all of those relations played out um, in terms of how this, this technique was um, turned into a, you know, a financial boon, and it, it really was for the people that got involved with, uh, with the Amarada. Oh, yeah, you think of the companies that exist today um, oh, yeah. because I mean, of this technology. It's pretty fascinating. Oh, there's no way that we would be where we are with um, anything that um, we do with, with Earth science if we hadn't, didn't have reflection size. Well, I'm, I'm biased, of course, but <laughs> I, I just think that's the reality. Well, we are, we are definitely at our time contract. Um, I thank you. Let me quit sharing my screen. That would help. Uh, stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Knapp, so much for what I personally found an incredibly fascinating talk. Um, and I encourage everyone to, to check out um, the link that I put in at SEG's website that's on the Seismic Reflection Centennial. Um, thank everyone for attending. And um, you go to HGS's calendar and Geophysical Society of Houston's calendar uh, to look for all the upcoming events uh, that will be going on with these technical talks. So thank you very much, Dr. Knapp. It was fascinating. Thank you so much and a uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, you can follow up with me with uh, email if you got any other questions. All right. With that, all I'm right. going to sign so much, off Betty. from HGS. Right.